and welcome. Today's guest is a highly decorated tech entrepreneur, former Fortune 100 corporate executive, sought after international speaker, trainer, strategist, ICF certified coach, and mentor who is committed to creating opportunities in the startup and corporate world for diverse and underrepresented groups. He is the co-founder and executive chairman of TechPass, a career pathway platform that helps college students connect with corporate recruiters and land their first job in tech. Now, in addition to almost three decades of service at some of the world's largest and most prestigious companies, he is a dedicated philanthropist. He currently serves on the board of directors of the International Coach Federation Foundation and the Institute for Sustainable Diversity and Inclusion. Please welcome Latin Business Magazine's top 100 U.S. Hispanics to watch and top 100 prominent Latinos in the business world honoree, Jose Pinheiro. Welcome, Jose. It is an honor to have you with us today. Ellie, first of all, it's great to see you. What a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. What an important um, field that you're in and how did you get so passionate about really empowering the underestimated and creating opportunities for diverse talent in, in both the startup and the corporate worlds? Yeah, uh, this is very close to my heart. Um, I, of course, I'm Latino. I look at my name, look at my face. Uh, I was born and grew up in Puerto Rico, came to the States for college and then worked in corporate America. And in my more than 25 years in corporate America, uh, at some point I led all diversity and multicultural for Microsoft, for their entire company. And at that point, I really, it really opened my eyes to see what were the challenges, the problems, some of the hurdles that women, people of color, uh, people from different origins, different orientations, different abilities have and face every day. And at that point, uh, this kind of became part of my life mission. Um, Ellie, people like you and I are, are very lucky. We are very lucky that we have had access to so many things. And I think it's so important for us to not only uh, continue opening the door for other people, but to also make things easier and better for them. So that's why I'm so committed to empowering and ensuring that, you know, the, what I call the underestimated, which are groups that have traditionally been underrepresented, get their fair share, get their fair shot. And to do that, there's so much that needs to be done. And I'm super thrilled to be here with you today to tell you about it. But this is something that I have lived and I have seen and I have taken as a personal mission to, to accomplish. So I'm thrilled to be here with you. And I, I would love to tell you a lot more about what we're doing, how, and how other people can also join the effort and also can help make things better for the future generations. Amazing. There is no question that there truly is disparate access to education. There's disparate access to opportunity. There's disparate access to funding. And there's disparate access to support and mentorship. So I love that uh, you are rolling up your sleeves and leading the charge. Uh, tell us more about how you're doing that. Yeah. So when we look at the, the challenges in terms of, and I love how you put it, disparate access, um, we can look at two things. We can look at what's happening in corporate America in terms of you know underrepresented and underestimated groups becoming part of corporate America. And then we can also see at this, a look at this from the perspective of the startup world. So let's start with corporate America. So in corporate America today, you know, uh, you look at the numbers, specifically when you go into, into tech, it's even worse. In tech, women are, represent only about 25% of the workforce. And then on top of that, women get paid less than men for doing the comparable job. So that's, that's, you know, that's terrible and something that needs to be addressed. When we look at the, the, per, the percentages of the population, for example, Latinos right now, we are about 19% of the, of the U.S. population. We are still in the single digits, you know, uh, in most corporate America jobs. And if we go to high tech, it's even lower. 
the same thing for African Americans. So I really hope that we get to, to parity, that we can really represent the communities in which we live and we work in the same way and in the same proportion. So there's so much there. And in a, in a few minutes, we'll talk about COVID and the impact. But right there, you know, we need to ensure that women, people of color, indigenous, different abilities, different orientations, that they get access to information, access to resources, that they find mentors and sponsors, that they understand basically how the game gets played, what works, yeah. what doesn't work. So a lot of this is it's about education, access to information, sharing best practices, coaching, sponsoring, mentorship, etc. So I've done a lot in that area. Um, I've coached um, as an executive coach tons of people um, who are working in top companies. And the funny thing is that it doesn't matter where you go, it, you find the same challenges, the same challenges. Like sometimes when I was starting my career, I thought, well, you know, things are very hard now, but when I get to a, an executive level, then things will be easy. Guess what? It wasn't. It was <laughs> as difficult, as challenging. Maybe the titles change. Maybe the, 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 the names of the problems change. But it's the same, the same things. Uh, these are the same things. So I think it's so, so important um, to provide that support. And support is something that everybody needs. Um, by the way, the, there's a myth uh, about the lone champion, you know, She was the person who achieved this and she did it by herself. Nobody helped her. The same thing. The CEO, he is, he did this all by himself. He moved a mountain and he achieved success. It's not, it's not real. That's not no. real. It's a myth. It's yeah, a myth. success takes a village, right? Success yeah, it takes a village. It takes a village. I've worked with executives of companies and luckily for them, they have an army of people. They have, you know, Uh, chief of staff, a speechwriter, a communications manager, uh, you know, liaison, like a planner, like uh, analyst, technical support. Like, it's an army. So, um, and it's really hard. And I think also, I think people that come from diverse backgrounds have a harder time asking for help. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of, hey, you know, don't rock the boat. There's a lot of cultural bias. We, we are, you know, we are raised to, Keep our mouth shut. Just you know, don't rock the boat. Don't ask. Don't don't make a big fuss. Don't ask for uh, a lot of help. So we have to change that, and it's through education. I really think the key word here is access. And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and would you say that that part of that part of the the struggle maybe mm -hmm. to ask for help or to speak up when you see the disparate access or to speak up if you're not getting the support or there aren't the processes in place. Do you think part of that hesitancy can also be the lack of community? So if you think, well, you're you're the lone wolf, if you think you're the yeah. the the token, mm. whatever the case yeah. may be, yeah. and you're so lucky, so lucky to have been chosen, so lucky yeah. to have that spot. Yeah. Um, you're the chosen one that maybe the the notion of rocking the boat or speaking up um, can kind of, there's a layer of, oh, I could be replaced. There's a layer yeah. of, I don't want to be the troublemaker. Yeah. There's a layer of, oh, I should be so grateful that that I was chosen, that I've oh. made it. Yeah. Um, all of I, those things are true. All of those things are true. You're right on all of those things. Um, you're right. Um, I think there are a few factors right there. One, there are cultural values. And in the work I do with seminars and, and leadership development, we, we address a lot of the cultural values yeah. of basically how we were raised, right? If you were raised um, in some cultures, for example, in Asian culture, silence is a sign of respect. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when the elders speak, you keep your mouth shut. You don't say anything, right? So if somebody that has grown with that value goes into corporate America, he, she, or they, they don't speak up in a meeting because they are just agreeing or because of a sign of, as a sign of respect, guess what happens? The leader in that meeting goes, Hey, I'm not sure that Paul is that engaged. I'm not sure he's really committed to this project. Yeah. You know, however, you know, Mary, she was speaking a lot in the meeting. She's really a go-getter. She's going mm -hmm. to make it happen. And, And then one person gets penalized or or misses the opportunity. So that's a classic example where cultural values come into play. 
The other thing that is very interesting is the role models. Yeah. We, you know, uh, I think it was Earl Nightingale who said something like, we define our opportunities based on what we see and what we know. Mm -hmm. So for example, if the best I saw in my community was that I could be the owner of the corner store, then that's what I aim for. Yeah. But when we go to a large company, if we don't see anybody that we can relate to or that we can say, hey, I, that could be me. That could be, you know, I could be the next, you know, Ellie. I could be the next John. Then it's really hard for you to even visualize that that's possible. And that's yeah. why moving people up and ensuring that we have the right role models that people can see somebody that they can reflect and, and see themselves in that person It's so important. Um, I, there was an example. There was a, a, a very successful Microsoft executive, and he's Latino, and he has a, you know a thick accent. I cannot tell you how many people told me directly later, "Hey," and you know they said, "Hey," because this other person, it's like the leader of the entire sales organization for Microsoft, and he has a big accent. I feel that I can also do it. So again, it's like something that you need that extra, that extra kind of like push or pull from somebody. So you're yeah, absolutely I mean, right. No community, no role models make yep. things 10x more difficult for, and it's for this, for women, people of color, people from different groups, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. You have to see it in order to even know that it's possible. Absolutely. You have absolutely. to be able to see it. I mean, that's why I have my nonprofit the Made to Change the World Foundation. It's mm -hmm. all about bringing in the mentorship. It's all about expanding the possibilities, allowing people to dream and to know, mm -hmm. yes, anything you want is possible. And this is what it looks like. And there is a path that you can follow to get there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. Great. You know, and that's so much about Uh, what you do with your mentorship and and the the programs that you offer and the processes that you put in place and all of the workshops that you've done. It's about, to your point earlier, these are the best practices. These yep. are the processes that you can follow. These are the routes that you can take. These are what opportunities look like. These are where there um, are gaps in the opportunities mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that can be filled. Absolutely, oh, absolutely. So, so one of the most um, uh, rewarding things uh, that I experience every few weeks is when I'm doing some either coaching or, or some leadership development seminar, and you can see the moment where somebody goes, oh, my God, that's why, right? Like the, mo the aha moment where they like, it clicks for them. They're like, that's exactly what happens with my boss, or that's why I feel this way. You know, uh, for example, a lot of uh, Latinos and African Americans in the in the workplace in corporate America, in a way, we're looking to kind of replicate the familiar and supportive bonds we have in our community. Yeah. I cannot tell you how many executives have told me, "Hey, I wish my boss would treat me on Monday like like my friends and my family treat me." Mm -hmm. Like they're looking for that, right? And yeah. and in a way, you know, the employee is right in wanting that. At the same time, we cannot expect the non, you know, non-Latino, non-African American manager to know that, right? Yeah. You know, the, the Monday morning hello. You know, if if on Monday morning the first thing I, I'd say, hey, hi, you know, hi Ellie, how are you doing? How's the project going? Like, I think, you know, if I didn't ask you about your weekend or yeah. what happened, yeah. you may feel that this person may, doesn't care about me. Yeah. So there's there's so much. So there's a lot of cultural value. Like you said, a lot of best practices. And I see the how moments when people go like, oh my God, that's exactly why this, you know, that's how I, why I feel this way. So the beauty of this, um, you know, I believe in, you know, let's call it, you know, I, I love math in the sense that I love probabilities. I want to aim for the things that have the highest probability of success. Yeah. And by the way, sure, there are exceptions to everything. But if, hey, 89% of people do something and it works, Most likely there's some value in there, right? So let's start Absolutely. with that, right? So there's a lot of a lot of um, understanding, a lot of education. And these are the things that I wish somebody had told me when I was starting my career. Because, you know, I was flying, you know, I was flying blind. I didn't know. Uh, like you said, you know, I, I just wanted to, you know, I replicated what I did in my childhood. Sometimes yep. that worked, sometimes that didn't work. And again, women, you know, you know, we, 
we have to help women assert their worth in the workplace. I cannot tell you how many female executives have told me, yeah, I had this idea, you know, I said it in the meeting, nobody kind of responded, then some male per, you know, person in the room said exactly the same thing, and everybody was so excited and supportive. And I'm like, yeah. wow. Yeah, so, and, and the sad thing is that there's an extra burden of, you know, of doing extra work for us. But we yeah. have to do that, otherwise we don't change things. So bottom line, a lot of the work I do with companies, it's both working with, let's say the diverse employee to help him, her, or they understand a lot of things, you know, what works best, what are the best practices, what are the gachas, all those things. And then also working with the non-diverse leader or manager to also help them understand how can they best work with people like us. And it's a two-way street. And we have to we have to meet in the middle. We cannot expect the employee to do all the work. We cannot expect the manager to do all the work. They have to meet somewhere in the middle. And to me, that's a success model I have seen in working with companies. Absolutely. And and one of the things that, that you mentioned, I think, is so important. So I want to circle back to it. The need to essentially be seen and heard and valued and to be respected, right? Whether that looks like uh, recognizing the cultural values or uh, the suggestions and ideas that are done in in a meeting mm -hmm. across cultural lines, there we're people, and yeah. so really the the need to be seen, to be heard, to be valued, um, to be supported and celebrated, those are those are really human values, and you know the majority if you are in corporate America and you're an executive, then then the the Caucasian contingent, these they are the majority. So they've kind of had that natural yeah. that that natural camaraderie, right? But to cross those those cultural lines, to cross the um the the racial lines, just to to be human, to be a human family. I mean there's there's a huge push to uh, to humanizing the workforce. I mean, Richard Branson and Virgin, uh, they have the 100% human at work initiative. We've yeah. got B Corps with, you know, really using business as a force for good. We have impact economics and using business as a force for good. And so I love that you're actually saying, okay, how can we take those broader concepts and apply them to the workforce? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that it's it's more inclusive. It's expanded opportunities. It's more inclusive opportunities. And the the magic really happens when we have that representation, the cross-cultural representation, the the um cross-racial uh representation. When when a company looks like the community. Mm -hmm. And it's got the open dialogue and it's got um, a, a culture of support. It's a, got a culture of training. It's got a culture of inclusivity. That's when innovation can really happen. Yep. That's yep. when um, things can become more efficient. That's when productivity goes up. I mean, all around, it's a win, 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 win. Mm -hmm. You're right. You're absolutely right. And uh, the best ideas come out of a conversation, of a discussion, of exchanging different points of view. And the, the, the best, uh, uh, the McKinsey study, you know, proves that, you know, companies that embrace diversity end up, you know, being more successful, uh, more profitable. So, so there's data supporting that. And sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes people go, oh, I just want the, you know, the, the fast decision and the fast, fast outcome. That may not be the best one. Um, you know, there, there's, when there's some creative tension, when people say, hey, but have you thought of this? Or, hey, I saw this other thing out here. Is there any relationship to this? That's when you end up with the better with the better plan. So it's, it's super important. It's super important to create inclusive, welcoming spaces, you know, where um, di different people feel that they can be a part of something. Uh, I love what you said about, um, you know, find somebody. This is a basic human right. 
I, I joke with people when I'm coaching them and I, and I say, hey, uh, find me somebody that doesn't want to be valued, respected, or loved. Yeah. If you find that person, I want to meet him, her, or they, because, you know, unless somebody's a sociopath or be, you know, or is mentally ill, that's a basic human need. And, and we yeah. all need that. The thing is that some people need it in some, in, in, in some potentially different ways. And, you know, white males in corporate America and in the, in the VC world, um, you know, they just have, you know, benefited from the privilege that they, that they have. Yeah. And again, you know, it's not, it's nobody's fault if they enjoy a privilege, but once you become aware of the challenges for other people, then I think it's our duty to make things better for others. So that's, that's how I look at this. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing that I want to touch and you mentioned it earlier is um, the impact of COVID on yeah. all these things and all these challenges. So let's, you know, let's, let's be open. The world and the corporate world was somewhat challenging for minorities and for women before. Mm -hmm. And with what happened with COVID, which is, you know, most people, um, most companies going into hybrid or remote work mm -hmm. arrangements, specifically when we talk about information workers, right? You know, people who are not in the front line, um, uh, consumer, uh, consumer or customer facing. So unfortunately, uh, African-Americans, you know, uh, black and brown people are quitting more than, than the average and than white people. And then the other thing that's happening is as companies are starting to try to pull people back into the office, more uh, people of color and women are wanting to stay at home or to work from home more days. So because they, you know, and, and let's let's look at the reasons for this. One, um, they're at home, but they're also taking care of other things that are happening with their families and their communities. Second, you know, we may have less access to services or to nannies or to childcare or other things. And third, you know, I also think there, there's something here that it could also mean, you know, some of, some of us didn't feel as welcome as we wanted to. So we feel better at home. Uh, but that brings another set of challenges because then uh, we were talking before about speaking up in a meeting. Um, I work with a lot of companies and a lot of teams ask me, hey, how do I show up uh, in, a, in a hybrid or virtual world where most of the calls are like this in a Zoom, Microsoft Teams or, or Slack or some kind of a video conference? And the answer is you have to be a little bit more proactive to show yep. up because here's the danger. Let's, let's take a, an average you know, woman. You are, you know, you're doing your job. Okay, you show up to the meeting. There are whatever, 10, 12 people in the meeting. So you're basically just one tile on the screen. And you're listening and you're taking notes and you, and you agree with what hap what's happening in the meeting. So at the end of the meeting, the meeting ends and you go and do, you know, do your, the rest of your job. If you did not say anything in the meeting, yep. it, it almost feels or some people, some leaders may think that you are not there, that you don't care, that you're not committed, that you are multitasking. So it's kind of an extra, you know, onus on us. Now we not only we have to be there but we also have to make sure that our presence is felt because yes. out of out of sight out of mind so for yeah. example i coach people that no matter what you have to say something in the meeting yep. you cannot Absolutely. be silent okay Absolutely. and if you and here's a joke uh, or the question people say well but what if i agree with everything and i don't have any questions and i don't have anything to add and then the feedback i give the suggestion i give to people is at least say that you agree with somebody Yep. What somebody said, and even better, ask a neutral, clarifying question. Yep. So it, it, don't ask a question to say, hey, Shelly, Ellie, I'm not sure what you said is right. No, don't do that. Or, or don't challenge somebody. But if you say, hey, Ellie, I love what you shared at that point about inclusion. Is there anything that we can also bring from this other effort into this? Or, hey, I love what, where you're going with this idea. Can you tell me more? And right there, it's a completely neutral to positive statement. Yeah. It opens the door for more conversation. And you as, a, as, as an employee, you get the points for participating. Because, and then psychologically, people, okay, you know, he's, he or she is involved, he cares, et cetera. So we have, to, yeah. we have to work with those things. Another thing that is very important, it's also how you show up. You know, um, you know some people are in the meeting, but, you know, the camera's there and they're like looking to the side or looking down. <laughs> And then you you don't feel they care. Um, 
we we had this uh these meetings with this executive and he kept turning off the camera because he was eating and at some point we had to say hey it's not cool for you to be eating or to if even if you just turn off the camera right there the subliminal message you're sending to all of us is that you don't care that much yeah so again you have to yeah. think through those things you have to think through those things and sometimes people you know it's by the way it's easier to put something in the chat than to say hey I, you know i want to add something or i want to just say that i agree with what ellie said blah blah, blah. like it's hard it's harder but we have to do that otherwise you kind of fall farther behind and that's not good for anybody yeah so, i mean to yeah. your point of of out of sight out of mind i think yeah. it is so important in this zoom universe uh to speak up to have your presence uh not just seen but but mm -hmm. felt and i love the action item that that tip and trick that you've given that anyone can use whether you are in corporate america or whether you're an entrepreneur or it, it doesn't matter we're all living on zoom <laughs> these days and i love the idea of acknowledging and asking a follow-up question and even if that follow-up question is, is is tell us more about that or is there anything else we can do that is an incredibly powerful question because it shows not only that you're present but that you're paying attention that you're engaged and that you care so That's valuable it. It. thank you so much yeah. for, for bringing that up yeah. super important Show, showing that you care goes so long because yeah. Um, you know, there are all these research studies on on employee satisfaction, um, and and one of the key things, uh, and I would say there's so many hot topics right now because of the the pandemic and the future of work. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But engagement is one of the key metrics. Yeah, people leaders want to know that their teams are engaged, and engaged means showing up and showing that you care, taking action. Right. So. It's so important, and it, I work with all these companies that have all these engagement tools now, and engagement is a super hot topic. The other one is well-being, which yes. is how do we ensure mm -hmm. that our people are all right? And at no point in history has well-being in the workplace been more important than now. So, you know, yeah, the pandemic brought a lot of challenges and a lot of, you know, hardship and, you know, a lot of, you know, unfortunate things. On, on the other side, the pandemic has accelerated the need for all these call it systems and services that are going to support employees and are going to make employees feel more engaged rewarded purposeful and more you know more included in the work so so there there's a good side of you know of what happened because a lot of companies thought they had three to five years to figure out hey what's the future of learning and development? What's the future of benefits? What's the future of diversity and inclusion? What's the future of the, you know, uh, how can we make the employee experience better, right? And yeah. COVID basically said, now all the things are needed now, right? Right and, now. You know, <laughs> yeah, and the, the joke uh, or the, you know, the challenge here, if we had asked companies three years ago, do you trust your employees to work from home and to not whatever waste their time or be lazy. They would have said, absolutely, would have said, not. absolutely not. No way. <laughs> you know, not, people yeah. people would have said, hey, if I cannot walk around and look over the shoulder, like you know, it sounds awful. But people would have said that. And then yeah. guess what happened? And now we all are all having you know to work. And frankly, what matters is the outcome. What yeah. outcomes are you producing? Um, when when I talk to a lot of people who are looking for jobs or switching careers and they go into interviews. And they ask people ask the classic question, hey, tell me a little bit about yourself, right? And people think that that question is about you telling your life story. It's not. It's not. Like that question, it's the setup for you to basically say or tell that person across the table, what value are you going to deliver for, the, for that company? Ultimately, we get paid, companies pay us to solve a problem, to fill a gap, to manage something, to take care of something like that's you know or or to increase revenue or lower cost that's what companies pay us and sometimes people you know I, i i have coached people it's kind of funny tell me a little bit about yourself or why are you a good fit for this job 
and the person starts telling saying well i'm a great fit because i'm looking for this and i'm looking for that and i want this and i really will what this thing is very important to me and i'm like ah it's not about you it's when you're interviewing it's all about what it's all about what can you do for the company so and i and when i tell people that people kind of in the first reaction is like oh like they don't feel good but it's a really good shifting frame here because if you go into an interview by you saying and con clearly communicating the value you will bring the outcomes you'll create they're going to want to hire you like Absolutely. so so it's a it's a mind shift here yeah and that's so important because uh there's a lot of openings in a workforce right now and there's a lot of people looking for jobs and so um what that's a, a really powerful tidbit that i want to highlight uh, it's not about you it's about how you can serve it's about the value that you can bring and i love we've been talking a lot about in a corporate uh setting but so much of this also applies to um entrepreneurship or uh if you're in the in the vc world the venture capital world and so i would love to dive in a little bit more specifically to uh if you are looking to launch uh, your own business or diversify your own business or scale your own business um if you're in kind of that startup model we know that there have historically been quite a few additional hurdles for mm -hmm. Um, underrepresented communities in securing capital, in securing uh, the the infrastructure needed to really get their business up and running. And so I love the the tidbits that you're giving because I also think that coming from that place of what's the value that you bring, how can you serve, how can you help. Um, uh, I would venture to say that that goes a long way with investors, that goes a long way with securing capital as well. So that that's a multi-dimensional tip that you just gave. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, so let's shift gears and talk about the startup world and you know, underrepresented groups. About I love using the word underestimated yeah. because it's like, hey, people underestimate us, people underestimate women, people underestimate people with certain abilities. So um, so yeah, so as we were talking, I spent about you know more than 25 years in corporate America. And then during the last year, I have immersed myself in the startup world. And I went in, frankly, not knowing much. Uh, you know, I know my experience from the corporate world and creating products and things, but I went into the startup world and guess what I found? Same challenges, you know, Same very, thing. very, yeah. very little female representation, yeah. very little African American, black, you know, Latino yeah. people of color, you know, indigenous, etc. So, so a few things there. One, um, the startup world, uh, I think, is so important because it's an engine of economic growth, yeah, and it's also Absolutely. an engine for empowering communities. Mm -hmm. I say this because it's proven. When yeah. you have a female CEO or co-CEO, guess what happens? The company hires more women. Yeah. When you have a, a, a diverse leader, guess what happens? More people, and it could be a function of both a deliberate effort from the leader, but also going back to the role modeling. If I see, hey, there's a company and here's the leader and I like, you know, she's inspiring and I can see myself being like her then you get attracted to that and then you also join that. And then the startup world is fascinating because it's where a lot of the innovation is happening. Uh, again, like you said before, it's all about solving problems, right? When you're in a startup, your job is to solve a problem that either tons of companies have or tons of people have. And if you solve the problem the right way, people are going to give you their money because it's a value exchange. Yeah. You know, when, when we go to, to a coffee shop and we pay five dollars for the coffee, the five dollars, you know, it's it's a good deal for us if the experience is if the flavor and the taste mm -hmm. and the experience, then you know, I'm happy to pay five dollars. And guess why we, how we prove that it, it's great value because I keep doing that, right? I yeah. go to the coffee shop I love every every other day and I get a coffee, right? If you you know, people talk about McDonald's, right? If you pay whatever, $3.99 and you get a burger and fries, whatever, 
it's great value for what you pay is great value. Again, if you buy a, a, you know, a, te a Tesla, it's great value. You get an amazing car and experience for what you pay. So the point is people are very happy to give, to pay money if the value they receive is greater. Yep. So when we move into the startup world, I love technology. Uh, I love that it's um, it presents scalable solutions. And I think that if we want to continue elevating women and communities of color, et cetera, we need to get those groups to not be just consumers of, of solutions and technology, but the creators and producers. Yeah. And that's why it's so important that we bring in more women, more people of color into this world. There are so many opportunities. And like you said, there are some challenges. The first challenge is basically lack of information and guidance. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the venture world, has been historically, you know, white male, and that's just what happened, right? You know, uh, yeah. we have to, and you know, it's kind of, it was kind of a club, right? You would get in, you would work for one of these VC firms or one of the, you know, of, of the startups that were successful. By the way, it's a, it's a hits model. People love betting again and again on people that have been yeah. successful. Yeah. So the hardest thing is raising your your money for your first startup and then being successful. Once you're successful one time, you're golden. You can then continue like, you know, recreating, et cetera. So, um, and there's some data, for example, TechCrunch has some data. Um, we have seen increases in the funding for early stage startups uh, for African-Americans to go up in the last couple of years. Uh, right. Unfortunately for, Lat for Latinos, for Latinx, it has been flat. So that's an mm -hmm. issue. A, a bunch of us got together a couple um, a month ago to discuss this problem because we need to make sure that we see that you know that increment in in the yeah. funding um but again the the most important thing is access to information sharing success models sharing best practices um like we said before making sure that we ask for help yeah. and there are many resources you know uh, female brown and black entrepreneurs who want to go into the startup world they shouldn't go or start alone. They should, no, absolutely they not. should work <laughs> with accelerators, incubators, startup studios, uh, mentorships, because there's so many things that you are going to face the same challenge. If you work with any of these other organizations, you may be able to learn from the best practices and avoid some very common mistakes. The other thing I'll say is there's so much content online Uh, you know, the Y Combinator, like video series and all these other groups, there's so much information out there. So if you have time, anybody has time, they can learn more. But to make a long story short, one of the efforts I'm doing is helping diverse founders start their ventures, start their companies. So if anybody's interested, you know, if, if you're a female, black, brown, special abilities, spe you know, se sexual orientation, et cetera, please, you know, reach out to me because I can point you in the right direction. Um, I am personally committed to bringing more, more diverse entrepreneurs into this world and to point them in the right direction. So every week I'm talking to three or four entrepreneurs, some great, some brilliant ideas, uh, some others that are harder to execute. But what I want to make sure people understand is that there's huge opportunity. There's huge opportunity. Companies today have problems that they want to solve and they don't have a technology solution for that. People, they, you know, the world's changing, keep thinking about new categories, what are the services that people may need in the future? And the, the stories are really funny, like Airbnb had to like change a couple of times, Uber was a disaster in the beginning, <laughs> yeah. and, and these are now billion dollar companies. Um, so it's not crazy for somebody to say, hey, I have an idea, raise a little bit of money, do a minimum viable product, show that it works, get some people excited, raise more money. And then suddenly, uh, you know, a year, two years later, that company may be worth 10, 20 million dollars. And you could be, you know, you could, you would have ownership of that. And your employees, the people that join you, ideally, you know, people that follow you, they also may, may benefit from that, from that valuation and from that um, equity. So it's Absolutely. a wonderful model, wonderful model. And People don't know enough about it. Uh, I go into some of these groups and we look at each other, uh, you know, small percentage of women, small, small percentage of black and brown. So we really need to invite more people and create the right environments. So more people also create 
technology solutions that would empower us. Absolutely. Uh, to your point, there are a lot of resources that are available. There are so many groups that are out there, mm -hmm. whether that whether you find them through your local chamber of commerce, whether you reach out to a local university and find out, you know, what organizations or groups they have, um, you know, at the business school for just for example, um, reach out to the small business association, reach out to uh, chambers of commerce, reach out, look on meetup. I mean, there are so many incredible organizations and groups where you can find mentors, you can find other people who are further along on the journey. And a lot of these resources are free. So it just takes a little bit of searching. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, they can reach out to you <laughs> uh, for sure. Um, but I think for so many people, they think I have this idea and I want to do it and it would be amazing. Yeah. But right? But there's yep. always the but, but I, I don't know where to start, but I don't have the money, but I don't have the, the actual materials to mm -hmm. make the prototype, but I can't get into the rooms where the decisions are, are made. And so I love the fact that we're highlighting that these resources do exist. And it's yep. just a matter of, of doing some some research of uh, finding them and then reaching out, asking for help, asking to join, um, asking for a call, setting up a call. Yep. Uh, just just get into circles of like-minded individuals. Get into circles of people who are looking to take inspired action, who are looking to make a difference, who are looking to to do the things that you want to do, and and especially circles where they have people at different stages of the journey. So people who are further along, yep. there's no need to reinvent the wheel. There's no need to go it alone. There's, there's no need to try to slog through and make all of the mistakes. I mean, if you can find someone that's already done it and they can say, here, take my hand, yep. let me guide you. Oh, don't step there. That's a really big landmine. That's yep. going to derail you or that's going to cost you a lot of money or here, let me let me you know show you this shortcut over here. Um, I mean, that's really how how change is going to happen in the entrepreneurial space, in in the VC space. You know, get into those circles, um, build the community, empower one another. Yep, agreed, agreed. Yeah. So yeah, so, this is a nice, a nice segue because I'm working on something that kind of bridges these two worlds. Uh, I'm working on. Uh, we created a startup called TechPass, and TechPass it's a it's a classic startup company, and it's it's really exciting because it's a platform to connect diverse college students with high paying jobs in tech. So right. to your point, people don't know like freshmen and sophomores in college, they they're like, oh, I hear about all these you know high paying jobs in technology, but I don't know how to get one. I don't know where to start. So guess what we created? We created a platform that gives the students a roadmap, a guided roadmap, so they can see exactly what are the steps they need to take, what are the, the trainings they need to take, what are the activities, the meetups, uh, what are the resources available. And we basically show the roadmap for the student. And then when the student completes a certain part of the roadmap, we tell them, hey, you're ready. Yeah. We can introduce you to a recruiter at Company X. The recruiter wants to start to get to know you. So the recruiters from the companies, they get to meet the students earlier than ever. They start yeah. building a relationship. And then guess what happens? If you do the things that we recommend, you're going to be a great candidate to win an internship or a real job. So yeah. we're marrying that they need, students need the guidance. Student needs to know, hey, what are the things and the steps I need to take? Because by the way, if you're if you don't come from the right, you know, network, mm -hmm. you may not have the, somebody saying, "Hey, here's what you need to do. Let me tap on your shoulder and bring you this way." Right. So we're yeah. doing that, and companies are hungry to discover amazing, diverse talent as yeah. early as possible. So it's a platform. It's called TechPass. Um, the URL is techpass.ai. Um, 
take check you know check it out it's a wonderful system that connects students and companies so we're very excited about that because that will get more diverse people into technology yeah. so they can learn how to program they can learn about data science jobs etc and then we're also helping companies because they're going to find greater talent we go beyond what a company typically sees on the radar and we do a really good job at presenting the candidates in the best possible way. Yeah. We kind of joke about it. It's more than the resume. We want to, <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> we, want, we want to share your story. And hey, many, many of us have great stories about not only here are the classes and here are the jobs, but here's what I do for my community. Here's some challenges I had to overcome. Here's something interesting about my personal experience. And we want to present that whole story. So we're very excited about TechPass. Uh, we're doing the pilot right now um, in the Midwest with about 12 companies, and it's going very well. So I'm excited for that. I'm excited to open doors for more diverse talent to get into technology. And that's yeah. just one example of a startup, right? People have all kinds of ideas. And and like you said, find the, find the resources, ask for help. Uh, for me, you know, easily anybody can connect with me on LinkedIn. It's very easy. Um, just reach out. Um, I heard... Um, a recommendation and advice from this person, Mickey Ibarra. He was a, an advisor to President Bill Clinton. He said to me, hey, Jose, what's the most powerful word in the English language? I'm like, I don't know, maybe love, uh, maybe. He said, it's a, it's a three letter word. So I'm thinking, yes, Y-E-S. He's like, no, that's not it. He <laughs> said, Jose, the most powerful wor word in the English language is the word ask you uh -huh. need to ask if you don't ask you're not going to get you need to learn how to continually continuously ask ask for what you want ask people for help ask people questions but ask so i, I and it was an eye-opening experience for me i'm like wow i never thought of it that way and sometimes you know we don't want to bother people you know sometimes we just want to take care of people and don't rock the boat we need to ask we need to ask and we need to to think about what do we want to achieve and then and then go for it. Absolutely. That's so powerful. Um, ask, use your voice, get clear on what you want, get clear on what you need, get clear on where you want to go, find the resources, find the support, and then ask. Ask for help, ask for what you need, uh, ask for recommendations, ask for referrals, ask, ask, ask. I love that. So really quickly, what would you say is uh, your best tip for resiliency or coping for someone who asks and then maybe uh, hears a whole lot of no? What, how can you help them to continue on? Yeah. So I like knowing my odds. What I like knowing my probability. For example, in the startup world, it's a 90% plus rejection business, right? You're going to ask 100 people, 90 are going to say thanks, no thanks, no, not interested, not now, talk to me later, etc. So once you know that up front, then you don't feel bad. Uh, and the other, the other line that I like, and a friend of mine gave this one to me, is the following. When you get a no, you can think about this. A no is a step closer to a yes. Because now you know that that person's not ready, but you learn from that conversation and you go to the next one. So you need to know the chat, the probabilities and not take these things personally. Um, by the way, on the startup world, I would say um, it's not for everybody because the rejection and the challenges are, are, are huge. Uh, somebody asked Elon Musk a few months ago, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs? Um, and what kind of motivation can you give to them? And his answer was pretty funny. He said, hey, if you need motivation and encouragement, then you shouldn't do it. Because it like, like what a lot of the things he has done, these are hard things sometimes. And you have to have a real strong belief in what you're doing, that is the right thing, that you're going to find a way. While at the same time, being very open to and flexible because in the startup world, most of the successful startups had to pivot had to change, had to modify things. Sometimes we think the winning idea is X. And then as you talk with 25 potential customers, you realize that what they want and what they need is something different. And you go and you adjust for that. So you have to have that balance. Uh, in the other part of well-being that comes to mind, it's more around 
mental well mental health um physical and emotional health we health health and well-being and it's really important for people to do self-care and to take good care of themselves nobody can just run a marathon you know 24 7 for 10 years nobody can do that we all need rest we all need to take care of of ourselves we need to make sure that we have enough positive experiences that you know some of us are sitting in front of a computer all day long we need to get up and walk we need to move just being seated all day long is not healthy for anybody um so again pick and and there's so many things right some people do yoga some people do mindfulness or meditation by the way i think a lot of those apps are wonderful so i know a lot of people that use them pick something pick one or two things that work for you for some people maybe taking a nice you know bath for somebody else maybe going out for a run for somebody else is just sitting and, and looking at nature for somebody else maybe talking to a loved one on the phone but pick something that fills your spirit and that makes you feel alive and good and make sure that you sprinkle that through your days because uh, a lot of the work whether you're in corporate or whether you're doing your startup a lot of people are going to be working very hard so it's important to pace ourselves so what do you do to uh, fill your cup what's your self-care uh, routine i a couple of things that bring me a lot of joy one um uh going for my coffee um i didn't drink coffee i live in seattle i didn't drink coffee a long time ago now i drink coffee and that's like an enjoyment moment so i love that uh you see a lot of guitars back there so i play a lot of uh, guitar uh that brings me a lot of joy when i and i hear a song on the on, on the radio or online and i just try to figure it out and i play it that puts me in a great zone and brings me a lot of happiness and then doing things with with family and loved ones um just conversations with my kids or with loved ones it's it's something that really brings uh, brings me a lot of joy and, and something that sounds really weird but I do get a lot of satisfaction and reward from doing things for other people. I do believe in service. I, I, you know, uh, there's a quote, I'm going to butcher it, but it's something about it's, you know, one of the life's purposes is for us to get lost in the service of others, something like that. I, I think when we are providing service to others, um, it's, it's something really beautiful and it brings me a lot of joy. I'm saying that, by the way, don't lose yourself, don't don't neglect yourself, uh, because I believe in the in the oxygen mask in the airplane analogy. You have to put the oxygen mask on you first before you can help those people around you. If you don't put the oxygen mask and you help everybody else and you don't put the oxygen on you, then you you die. So put the oxygen mask first, take good care of yourself, and then be of service to others. So that brings me a lot of joy. And then a lot of other little things, you know, I love reading, so I'm, I'm super curious and reading brings me a lot of joy. I'm kind of a, a, a nerd for like useless factoids about a lot of things in life. So, you know, things that bring a smile to my face are really good for the heart and for the mind. Absolutely. And you definitely live a life of service. You definitely live a life of impact. You bring so much joy to the world. You show up so powerfully in the world. As we start to wind down here today, let's imagine that you've come to the end of your best life. It has been your life just full to the brim, mm -hmm. your life best lived. Yep. What do you want them? to say about you when you're gone? What do you want to be remembered for? Yeah, so my personal motto is very simple. It's leave things better than I found them. Uh, and I do my best, I try uh, to, to live that and to embody that every day. And to me, there's a kind of a very easy way to think about it. And that's the, as follows. It doesn't matter who it is or what happens. If I have an engagement or I have a conversation with you, I hope that at least you feel a little bit better than before we met, a little bit more uplifted, a little bit more excited about the future, a little bit more 
uh, encouraged about, about what you're doing and possibilities. So, and it doesn't matter whether the conversation was a two minute conversation or a two hour conversation. I think we all have the power to do that. So that's to me, you know, I, I, I want people to feel better. I want people to think, hey, you know, whatever in, engagement or interaction I had with him, um, he made me feel good or he, you know, he was able to show me something greater than what I believe at the time. So that's, that's how I want to live life. And sometimes it's not about the humongous things you do. It's a lot about the many, many, many smaller things you do. And then when you look at that from a very macro perspective, you can see the trend and you can see the impact. Uh, so that's, that's how I think about this. And of course, I, you know, I want to make sure that more people, uh, what I call the underestimated, so women, black and brown, and other diverse groups, end up in a better place. And that's why we're doing tech paths. That's why I'm doing all the work with startups. That's why I do the work with corporations, because there's, there's a lot of upside there and a lot needs to be done. And I think it's up to us to make that change. So I really, you know, 20, 30 years from now, I want to be able to look at numbers from companies and say, yeah, women are not 25% of the workforce in tech companies. Women are 55%. You know, I want women to be more than half, right? Um, I want, you know, I want people of color to be represented at a minimum at the same level as they are in the general population in the U.S. So those are some benchmarks for me to think about. So that's it. You know, hopefully helping make things like better for, for others. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here again. Thank you for the, the work that you do. Um, thank you for the opportunities that you create and the communities that you build and the people that you nurture. I know that this legacy that you envision, uh, you're living it every day. You're creating it every day. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for all the work you're doing to also drive incredibly powerful, super positive social impact and, and creating opportunities and helping people achieve their dreams. I think that's super important and I applaud you from your work, for your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Till next time. Thank you.